Mike Rucker, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you again, Ali. You too. You too. And it's been a pleasure getting your, your book in the mail, The Fun Habit. And I want, I want to start by saying, like, I've, I've recommended this book to several people already. And almost oh, all you. of them, when I say the title, they think it's a book about making habits more fun. Like how to be more, <laughs> you know, like how to do your, you know, how to, you know, like, and I'm like, yeah, no, yeah. no, it's about fun. It's fun <laughs> is the, is the, um, the key word here, not, not habits. So, um, t- so yeah, let's, uh, let's just, let's dive in. Why'd you write the book? <laughs> yeah, no. And I mean, I think there's certainly some components about how, you know, if you have, if you've habituated certain things of your life that are routine and they've become bored, you know, there's some hints in there about that, but to your point, um, You know, I've been a zealot of positive psychology for some time. And what had happened to me was I have up to 2016, I had over optimized my life uh, for happiness. So in the rearview mirror, that's easy to to say. Um, But uh, at, at that point, I had really become overly concerned with this idea of happiness, right? I essentially succumbed to what we now call toxic positivity, right? And at the time, I don't think many of us knew that that was overly problematic um, because it really hadn't been, um, you know, that phenomenon hadn't been well studied. And so we didn't understand that, you know, all of this motivation that doesn't really meet you where you are is actually creates dissonance. And so I think a lot of us were creating these waves, right? We're like, oh, you know, something like gratitude journaling within reason or, you know, within the realm of what makes sense for you is a great tool, but telling somebody to, you know, forcing them to find three things a day to be grateful for when potentially they're not in the right mindset actually can point someone in the wrong direction, right? And so my personal story is I had used a lot of these tools pretty effectively. Again, you know, maybe through luck and serendipitous uh, serendipity, but I had like literally started quantifying my happiness, right? I was like creating a spreadsheet. Oh, I would do this thing. This is how I feel about this day. Uh, I, at the time I was living in San Francisco. So I got connected with Gary Wolf. And for folks who don't know who that is, he's kind of the figurehead of the quantified self community. And so, you know, I really started, um, you know, playing with different things, playing with fitness and, and things of that nature. And so, you know, I've, I've really reached this peak and we'll unpack why that becomes problematic for anyone. Um, but I got knocked off of that peak because unfortunately my younger brother passed away quite suddenly from a pulmonary embolism. Um, and then after being a lifelong runner, found out I had, and these two uh, are related to each other, but they just happened to happen within the same year, found out I had uh, advanced osteoarthritis likely due to an injury that had gone unnoticed and was gonna need a hip replacement at a young age. And when you get a hip replacement at a young age, you're essentially told not to run because you know mechanical parts in your body are essentially like car parts, right? They have, they have a certain um, uh, amount of mileage and you don't really wanna go in for revision. So if you get one later in life, sometimes you know uh, some physicians will say it's okay to run. If you get one in your 40s, you know, since the shelf life is about 30 years, you, you just don't want to run because it, you know, bangs them up too much. So that's all to say, like, here I was, you know, kind of at the top of my game. And one, I was introduced to the fact that time is finite, because I think so many of us that aren't introduced to death in some way, uh, you know, take that for granted, right? We kind of just mortgage off um, various things within our life, um, you know, for in the pursuit of achievement and forget that, you know, the corpus of our life is, is pretty short. And so I was woken up to that reality. And then I had to grieve this uh, loss of identity because I really identified as a runner and a triathlete, and that wasn't going to be a part of my life anymore. And because I've been such a zealot of positive psychology, you know, and I, I am a fan of optimism. I was like, I'm going to will myself out of this malaise. Right. I'm a, you know, and, uh, and so I was kind of a guinea pig, you know, an N of one. Um, and uh, what I found was that the more I tried to chase happiness, paradoxically, um, I was making myself a lot more depressed. 
And so now I know in retrospect, it's because, you know, when something like a, a death of a loved one happens, you need to take time to mourn. That's just part of the human condition. And when you don't, when you push that down for whatever reason, it can lead to clinical outcomes. Now all this, you know, since 2016 has been well-researched. Um, one of the professors I love, Dr. Iris Mouse, who I talk about in the book, um, has looked at this in mass, right? This kind of Western phenomenon of, of people that don't necessarily value happiness as a construct, like us wanting to be happy, me wanting you to be happy, wanting the world to flourish. There's nothing wrong with that, right? The, the, the frame is folks that are overly concerned with their own happiness all the time to the extent it becomes rumination um, is pretty much a direct path potentially to, you know, poor clinical outcomes like anxiety and depression. And so to answer your question and button this up, that's, that's when the journey started, like, holy cow, you know, here I am valuing happiness as a construct and kind of worrying about it and trying to play with it. And it's actually um, quite problematic. And why is that? And, and if it is problematic, where does that lead me? What can I do? And that's what led the fun. Um, you know, essentially you can still enjoy your life even during periods of despair, um, you know, big life changes and things like that, and not necessarily have to identify with ha happiness or, or worry, you know, worry about why you're not happy. Mm. Well, I guess it, you know, it kind of goes to the, you know, the fundamental question that I don't think, I think any of us are encouraged to ask, which is like, what am, what am I trying to optimize in my life? Right. Like happiness seems like the most obvious thing from a, you know, consumer perspective, right? Cause that's like, that's, all the reasons I'm working or spending money or doing this is like, oh, I, you know, I want to feel good right now. And there's like this, okay, so I understand that I have to feel bad now in order to make the money to feel good later, or I have to feel bad now in order to get the grades in order to feel good later. But it really does feel like a video game, right? Where, where there's a, this, where some, this thing called happiness is the outcome. And we know from, you know, every wisdom tradition, that that that's not the, the end, but what, like so, when when you when you sort of realize okay, this pursuit of happiness is a dead end, and you allowed yourself to feel all, everything else, like what bubbled up as a replacement, you know, direction of life or or a, you know goal? Yeah, that's a great better. question. I I think what happened was. Well, one, you know, I had been introduced to mindfulness and my academic background in workplace wellness. I, stu I studied the construct of autonomy and how much autonomy really is one of the main mechanisms for well-being at work, right? We know that when autonomy is taken away, um, you know, it's not just physiological or excuse me, psychological outcomes. It's generally pretty significant physiological outcomes. So, I think that was the bridge to understanding like, okay, wow, I have habituated my life in a way that I have relinquished a lot of that agency and autonomy, right? And so to answer your question, if I was so outcome focused and again, you know, kind of leaning on the wisdom of others and wisdom of spiritual tradition, you know, although I don't prescribe the one, I certainly think that there's a corpus of wisdom to be found you know, when you look at that, not through the lens of dogma, but in just the lens of the corpus of wisdom uh, uh, of, you know, various cultures, if you can relinquish like, okay, I have to be happy, then you can start to look for contentment in the things that you are doing, right? And so there's a whole host of tools to do that, that are invigorating, not necessarily depleting, because you can do them in abundance, right? Like if, you know, the context as trivial as this sounds is really, do I have to do these things or do I get to do them? Because any of us can kind of quit life and live as a nomad if we want, right? Um, you don't, you know, some people insist on like, you know, especially if you have a family or whatnot, well, I have to take care of others. That's not necessarily true. I, I don't, it's not ethically, right? But you could walk away from everything, right? There are people that do that all the time. And so coming from that frame and saying, okay, well, actually there's a bit of privilege to everything I do. And I also have the autonomy and agency to dictate how I do those things. Then you can start to play with those, right? Like, well, 
I want to make sure that my kids are safe and thriving. What are opportunities to do that in a way that provide joyful experiences? For me, it was co-creating, you know, amazing experiences for my kids rather than just sort of sitting on the bench, you know, of whatever we were doing, whether that be at the park or, you know, tumbling class. Instead, doing those things together in a joyful way that where we co-created those experiences, it wasn't necessarily like the, my kids felt that it was prescribed to them or me feeling like I was doing it from a sense of duty. That's just one example, right? And you can start to play with, you know, I kind of boil it down to three main variables, the environment we're doing it in, the people that we're doing it with, and the actual activities. Um, and we can unpack the third one more. Like, you know, oftentimes when people get stuck, well, you know, I have to do my taxes. Well, that's probably true, but are there ways to look at that activity as kind of an anthropologist and see if there are ways to you know, unpack it in a way that might be a little bit more enjoyable. You know, maybe there aren't. There's certainly going to be things that we have to do, right? That's just you know, because life is full of, of some things that are uncomfortable. Um, but there are so many things that we've taken for granted that if we approach them with a degree of mindfulness, we can also make them more joyful. And so that's the crux of my argument. All right. So I'm imagining someone might have listened to your the introduction here and talking about like the futility of chasing happiness and thought that we were going to end it, in, you know, that the conversation was going to go in a very different place around, you know, purpose or um, acceptance of life suffering from a very <laughs> Buddhist perspective. And that's all in there. And I'm not I'm not um, dismissing any of that from the conversation. But we go from like chasing from like chasing happiness to pursuing fun. And I think when a lot of people hear fun, it's like happiness, but trivial, right? It's like there's something almost extra about fun that means like, if, you know, it's the thing you, you know, you, if you eat your broccoli and your peas, then maybe <laughs> you'll get you'll get a slice of cake. So what like what is good about fun? Yeah, I mean, it's restorative, right? I think what you're seeing now, um, and the, you know, we talked about this a little bit before we hit record. It's, it's similar to where we were in the 90s with regards to, you know, celebrating sleep deprivation, right? It's this idea that, you know, if I can just squeeze a little bit more out of my waking hours, somehow there's going to be this reward at the finish line. And we're seeing the same with leisure, right? One of the studies that was like a big aha moment for me. Um, and again, I mean, it's a, it's a landmark study, uh, Stanford, MIT, and Harvard, 28,000 uh, um, folks surveyed. So we're not talking about, you know, one of these kind of, you know, fringe, uh, small sample size studies where they looked at the concept of the hedonic flexibility principle, right? And so um, what they found, which isn't surprising, is that folks that aren't enjoying themselves you know, at the end of the day, they tend to look for what we call in the literature passive leisure or poor forms of escapism, right? That might be drinking, that might be, you know, just kind of displacing boredom with social media use. Um, it might be, you know, plopping down on the couch because you have no energy at all and just channel surfing, um, you know, things of that nature. The folks that had some sort of transition ritual between, you know, this dutiful life that we talked about, because you should live a life of purpose, as you point out, I never make an argument, you know, for kind of a, a you know, he, you know, separating hedonic tone, which is a psychological concept from the ethical, you know, constructs of hedonism. I, I'm not prescribing hedonism by any stretch. But um, again, this idea of at least enjoying some of the things that you do, when you're able to do that, then you approach the next day with a vigor and vitality to do the hard stuff. And so if you're someone that cares about productivity, if you're someone that cares about making an impact, thinking about the long game, you know, figuring out ways to not burn out are important, right? And we've learned that well about sleep. And we're now learning that clearly about leisure. And what's really interesting, um, which I'm still trying to unpack, I mean, I've gotten some of the clues, is why the US is the last to wake up to this, right? And that the EU has certainly gotten wise you know, the, the, the things that they're doing and the results that they're seeing, right? I mean, they're in earnest playing with four-day work weeks. And, um, you know, France has just made it illegal to send emails over the weekend to really preserve 
you know, at least two days of leisure. For folks that have a religious slant, you know, the Sabbath wasn't just, you know, a godly act. I mean, there's a reason for that, right? Because humans need renewal. I mean, you know, study after study proves it, but for whatever reason, we feel like if we just squeeze one more hour of productivity, regardless of how we feel about it, you know, then somehow that's virtuous. Some people think that it's still a relic of the Puritan work ethic. I think there's a lot more um, than just that. You know, I think there's headwinds with regards to knowledge work. We really never know when the week is over if we don't communicate well with our leadership, right? Or if we're entrepreneurs, there's always another email to answer, another tweet to look at, right? So our days literally can be endless and we just don't stop ourselves, right? Um, and then with regards to the way that messaging devices work now, they're as insidious as social media. You know, those those pings and the, the little LED light on your phone, they become infectious because, you know, for anyone that knows behavioral science, the allure of a variable reward, is that next email gonna be kind of, you know, interesting or, you know, lead to my next paycheck? Those are powerful draws. So if we don't create bumper rails, we really can see ourselves working throughout the night, even when we didn't necessarily set that out to be the case. And so there is, you know, multiple headwinds kind of keeping us on all the time. All right. Although not, not, I mean, many of those headwinds apply globally, but the U.S. seems particularly susceptible. You know, I, I remember I've done a fair amount of traveling to other cultures, and I remember as a, you know, young Americanocentric person being really <laughs> struck by the fact that people were like very serious about siesta, like they would close at 2.30. And I'm like, oh, but I want to buy something. Don't you want my money? And they're like, no, I would rather have my two hours than your money. They're like, that is so un-American. That is just, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't you know. What, and it doesn't come from a bad place. So one of the things, like I mentioned, you know, you're a scientist as well. And so you hate to make assertions that, you know, where they're essentially just theories. And, and that's where I am with this thing that I'm about to say. So I'm not saying that it, you know, it's necessarily grounded yet, but I think I'm onto something. And that is that we don't lack empathy. You see US employees have the same amount of empathy as you know other Western world employees, but the difference is our empathy is towards not wanting to let our colleagues down, right? When we're on vacation, for instance, like mm. I just need to get this report done because if I don't, you know, then it's gonna affect my whole team. Where you look at, you know, I have colleagues in Oceania, you know, both New Zealand and Australia, as well as, you know, uh, friends and colleagues throughout the EU. And they'll be like, hey, I got your back. You know, like when you get back to your desk, you know, there's not going to be anything sitting for you. You know, just get back to work when, when you're home and have a great time, you know, with your kids and family. Like hope you, you know, hope it's amazing. Right. And so the empathy is there and it's the same, but it's backwards. Right. And we're getting it, you know, like, so there are a couple other things just to like stick with leisure for a second and then we'll move on. I mean, you know, I write about it in the book, but it was just reaffirmed, you know, it was all over LinkedIn the last couple of weeks. We're still second to last with regards to the amount of leisure we give our employees, you know, in the developed world. There's only one country below us, Micronesia, right? We, we give 10 days for one year's worth of work and Micronesia gives nine. But what I think is more illuminating there is even though we're second to last, you know, in the developed world, only 50% of employees are taking that mm. measly 10 days, you know, 50% of employees are just letting that roll over to the next year. And we're seeing the consequences of that, right? We have record amount of burnout. Um, and this was a problem pre pandemic, but the pandemic poured fire on it. And again, you know, it's, it's pretty, you, it's not a big leap to understand why this is, and yet we're doing very little um, to mitigate it. And you're seeing Fortune 100 companies get wise, like they are now incentivizing us to take vacations. And that's not to be benevolent, that's because they know one, it will lead to retention, right? Because at least there's some sort of, of caring. Um, but they also know that you come back and you're, you're more productive. When folks are burnt out, they're, they just don't make good employees. So, you know, whatever the reason, um, you know, for them, you know, trying to instill this, I think we're at the cusp of potentially getting it right here. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's amazing how long it's taking us. Hmm. 
Is there a danger, though, of still like with sleep saying that the reason that, that sleeping is a good idea is to achieve productivity, right? That, that going too too far. Is there a danger in, in doing the same thing with leisure and still saying, OK, you guys need to do leisure so that we can be productive? Because I, I remember in, in yeah. the in the 90s, I was following a Dan Sullivan from, you know, a strategic mm -hmm. coach. And he yeah, said yeah. something that totally like flipped my mindset, which was basically that you mm -hmm. don't take vacation. You don't work in order to earn vacation. You take vacation in order to earn good enough work that you can't you can't yeah. do your best work if you're not. Right. So is, is there a danger of just all of us? Turn, you know, then qu becoming quantified selves about leisure so that we can be productive. Like that's the end goal of humanity. No, no, I think you're exactly right. I think uh, there's a couple of things there. Um, so one, yes, it's funny, it's, <laughs> you know, especially because I do have colleagues and and I enjoy quantified self. I um, really follow the work uh, of someone in, in your neck of the woods, Jordan Ekin out of Duke. She's done great work in here. And to quantify certain aspects that you're trying to improve, like there's no harm in that, right? And I won't get off on the rails with that, but what I'm suggesting is that I'm still a believer in quantifying some things. Mm -hmm. um, and, but what I, where I was going with that is like those same colleagues are like, so, you know, so what are the quantifications of fun? Like how much, you know, like, should I be having you know, fun at a level of eight. And I'm like, okay, just read the book. Like, you, you know, sort of like Tolly's power of now, right. Trying to explain somebody that, you know, the, all of the wisdom in that book in, in, in three lines, not that I'm trying to, to compare myself to him, but um, where I would go with that is that if there is, if you're focusing on the outcome at all, you've kind of, you've lost half the battle, right? The idea is you can either you know, operate through the lens of martyrdom. Like, you know, I need to grind things out and things shouldn't be fun because I'm sticking to that old Puritan ethic. or, Hey, Oh my goodness, I can be more productive and sort of enjoy my life and not fall victim to, you know, the five regrets of the dying that Bronnie Ware has made us all so aware of. Right. And so I think that's one thing for the folks that do need the science. Uh, this was again, a level of serendipity, but right as I was finishing the book, a uh, professor out of UCLA by the name of uh, Dr. Cassie Holmes, who has her own amazing book similar to mine called The Happiest Hour, uh, really looked at these time surveys and found that the sweet spot is about two to five hours of leisure a day. And so um, if you're having less than two hours, it generally means that you are uh, you have a propensity to, a, you know, not necessarily be burning out, but, you know, that starts to get problematic. Um, over five hours, then you start to skew into, wow, I'm not, you know, my life might be lacking some purpose, you know? Uh -huh. And so uh, she calls it the Goldilocks spot. So for folks that do need that quant, um, I'm leaning on the wisdom of, of someone who's actually researched um, what that sweet spot is. And, it's, um, you know, uh, you know, again, based on evidence, it seems to be about two to five hours a day. Right. So, I mean, one thing that comes to me when I hear those numbers is there is a conspiracy of capitalism to keep us really far away from that. Um, like, you know, I can imagine people think like two to five. I can't imagine two hours. I can't imagine more than an hour or two a week of leisure mm -hmm. with all my responsibilities at work and at home and community and whatever. And other people saying, well, damn, I, you know, where's the money? Show, show me the paycheck that allows me to have that kind of, uh, of, of freedom. And it feels like, you know, both of those are kind of imposed on us by, by a system that in some way benefits by eating us up and spitting us out. So, so that we're, we're we can't, I agree you know, with you wholeheartedly. I mean, I, yeah, I, uh, you know, someone who found my work early, this is before the book even came out, was, uh, you know, you're, cha you're channeling Alan Watts. And I had, like, uh -huh. seen his memes or wh whatnot. But, uh, you know, you know, obviously, when someone compares you to someone else, I started, you know, and I, Alan Watts has his own problems. So I'm not gonna sell, you know, put him on a pedestal. But I think he was on to something, right? I mean, uh, when you look at his arguments with regards to meritocracy, um, and how we are socially conditioned, you know, that 
um, you know, the finish line is at kind of 70 and then, you know, to channel also Shel Silverstein, we're kind of just sitting, you know, on that tree stump wondering what the hell happened. Um, <laughs> that, you know, we know what happens, right? Like you look back and you end up with a lot of regret. And so trying to find a corrective before that happens becomes extremely important to honor your question and answer it. I think that's where we're at, but I, you know, sometimes you get stuck in your generation, right? And so I am working with a lot of Gen Xers and, you know, just that immense amount of guilt to not even just have fun, but to be calm, like, Hey, just sit for an hour, you know, you know, just, and like that discomfort, but I, I need to be doing something. Yeah. But if you do something, you're going to do less the next day. Yeah. But I'm just uncomfortable. I just, I've got to move. Right. Like it, it, it's almost bizarre. So it does require work. I think the good news is folks that do engage in that and see how much they show up as a better version of themselves generally only takes like three to four weeks. And then you're usually off to the races. They're like, you know, oh, okay. So, you know, you also mentioned like, okay, well, what do I do for money? Are you going to pick up another job? That's always an option, right? Like, you know, so where, when the conversation gets steered that way, I'm like, okay, well, do you need more money? You can drive Uber. There's always ways to make more money if that's going to, you know, be the thing that you value, but you can't make more time. Right. And so what I would suggest is across socioeconomic constructs, and this has been replicated in studies, not just here in the US, but across the globe, those folks, even if they're sort of, you know, lower to mid middle class, obviously there's a, a certain threshold and this has been well talked about where you need a certain amount of money, right. To, you know, to sort of experience happiness when you're really worried about, you know, your living conditions and how you're going to get food that becomes problematic. And, you know, listening to a podcast about fun probably isn't a great use of your time. Right. I mean, I, I understand some of these arguments come from a place of privilege. Right. Um, so just to make sure that we're uh, doing that justice, but for folks, even in the lower middle class, the ones that value time over money. So really understand that that's a construct they can't make more of. But that money can, you can, you know, accumulate more of it when you do need it, um, tend to live happier lives. That's just, as a generalization, that's just true. It's been replicated over and over again. And so what I would suggest is being as judicious about time as you are with money becomes important. And the first step is to understand if you bought in to this sort of meritocracy, like, hey, I just need to work a little bit harder and then somehow you know, my self-worth and value is going to go up. Ask yourself why you think those things. And so, you know how <laughs> we kind of over-prescribe on Simon Sinek's why, you know, which was essentially a tool for companies to get you to buy into their mission. If you kind of, you know, are one of those people, well, I got to know my why. Also know your what, like, what are you giving away and what are you getting in return? Is it a true exchange of value? You know, is, does your company really work? you know, value your well-being? Or are you part of Google and Facebook that as soon as you're not making them money, they're going to lay you off, right? And so, you know, figuring out what that balance is, because none of these are bowling, right? It's not an either or. But I think right now, especially here in the U.S., we're in such need of a radical course corrective because of these detrimental outcomes. Again, you, post-pandemic, you know, because a lot of my research was done with physicians, Physicians now are at the highest rate of burnout they've ever been, 63%. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a crisis, right? So, and that's just one vocation. I mean, you're seeing that across the board, you know, on all vocations, so. Yeah, so I mean, it's at some level, what, what, what you're asking people to do could be very surface level, like just grab an hour and, you know, do a crossword puzzle or go for a walk or, or play paddle ball or something, you know, some, some very surface level thing. But on the other hand, you're asking people, I think, to do really deep excavatory soul work to kind of reclaim their own agency over their own lives and values. Like there's ways in which we have all been sort of colonized by these different work ethics and different perspectives on money and worth that, you know, even if I, if I, say, okay, Mike, I'm going to like do your thing. I'm going to, I'm going to start playing pickleball three days a week. And, and now I'm, I'm going through all this 
mental gyrations around how much do I deserve to play pickleball and, you know, how much work do I need to do in order to justify the pickleball and am I being a good person by playing pickleball when there are people who are starving somewhere? And, you know, to kind of like let go of the kind of responsibilities that have been placed upon us that we've maybe interjected and don't even realize, like that seems like some pretty deep work. Yeah. And so, you know, that's why the book kind of ramps up, right? It's not a linear path, um, I, you know, for folks that do make it to the end, I essentially show how these mechanisms are important to the folks that are doing the most impactful work, right? By highlighting, you know, the folks that are the biggest change makers are the ones that find ways to take time off the table for themselves. Because when we live through that lens of sacrifice and duty, ultimately we don't have a long game, right? When we succumb to um, that kind of, you know, idea that our self-worth is tied to productivity, we, at some point, our wheels are going to fall off. And so it's the folks that find ways to light, you know, to use a playful term, light themselves up, to recharge their batteries, to actually understand that parts of life are worth living, are the ones that are able to do the most impactful things, you know, whatever that means to you. One of the most complex parts of creating this work, right, was that one, fun is as individual as the individual, right? Like, so, you know, I can't tell you to go play pickleball because 90% of your audience might be like, well, I hate pickleball. What's this idiot talking about, right? So one is kind of deconstructing what fun means. I really leaned on the work of Jeannie Sai here out of Stanford because another Western headwind is that we've said that high arousal activity is what fun is, right? And so a lot of people... Mm you know, will tell me, uh, I, I just don't know how to have fun anymore. Well, do you enjoy reading a book, but you know, poolside? Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. I would, you know, well, then that's fun for you. Like, is it pleasurable? Like, that's all we're talking about here, right? You know, in geek speak, we call it positive valence. And so that's another, you know, people think they've forgotten how to have fun. It's just a rage against the machine concert isn't their thing anymore. Right. And they're like, Oh, I don't want to go back there. Of course you don't. You've changed. Right. So figure out what fun means to you. And then the second argument is when you're not living a fun life, you aren't showing up as the best version of yourself. So, you know, I think someone I'm stealing this analogy from someone else. I talk about it in the book, you know, with regards to these uh, optimum, excuse me, optimal zones of arousal. But like you wouldn't run a marathon running your fastest mile, you know, the first five miles. Right. Because you wouldn't make it to mile 20. I've, and that's I've what tried. so many of us are doing. Yeah. <laughs> I've, so literally, I've, I've literally I, tried that, during marathons. I, I, <laughs> I keep learning that lesson. My uh, coach, you know, when I still was a runner, was like, stop being a rabbit. And it's like, I, you know, yeah. um, uh, you know, and that's what, you know, folks like Jeff Galloway, you know, that he has his detractors, but he's like one of the most successful marathon coaches because it's a sustainable way. Right. And so I've never thought about it in this term. I like I like Jeff a lot, but like essentially, I guess I'm the, I'm the Jeff Galloway of work. Right. Like take some walking breaks, because guess what? You're going to get to the finish line. And 80 percent of the people that take this advice are going to actually PR. Right. And so anyways, for and folks just, that just don't for, know, Jeff Galloway's yeah, work are probably lost. But. Yeah. Just say, say a few words about him. So we, non, non marathoners. Get, get up yeah. So uh Jeff landed on the fact that for a majority of folks um, that especially are recreational marathoners would actually do better by running really fast and then taking intermittent walk breaks. And so purists, folks that have inherent running ability, um, were like, who is this joker? And he, he got made fun of a lot. But then lo and behold, over time, It was one of the most sustainable ways to run a marathon. And for a lot of people, it was also the best way to run their fastest marathon. And so, uh, again, now that you understand why I brought him up, I think the same is true for life. So many of us are told, you know, just sprint as fast as you can, because that's the, you know, you know, read emails while you're taking a poop, because, you know, why not (laughs) squeeze another five minutes of productivity out of, you know, every waking minute. And we don't realize the toll that's having 
you know, our brains are still organs. And so they need to slow down too. They need to have, you know, they need to shut down. They need to find flow and flow doesn't happen when we're uncomfortable. You know? Yeah. And I have to say that I, you know, I, all my marathons have been uh, Galloway and they, it always felt fine to do the, like, you know, one minute of walking after every mile of running until somebody passed me while I was walking. <laughs> And that just like triggered every fiber in my being. They're like, don't let that happen. Like, <laughs> Did you ever counter that though when you um, uh, ultimately ran past them? So I had the same feeling, but then, you know, souped in, I, more times than not, because there certainly would be people that I wouldn't catch up, but I, I, I more times than not, I would catch those people eventually because I would run faster than they could um, because well, I was one of the folks that... Benefited yeah, from I mean, we, there, are, there are people we, we pass each other 15 times and the closer we yeah, got yeah. to the final you know, stretch, I, you know, the more important it became that I was on the on top. Right. Well, and I think another important thing there and then we'll move on is that uh, how many people end up walking mile, you know, you hit the wall around mile 20, 21. Um, and again, sorry for folks that <laughs> don't speak marathon. Um, and then you those folks end up walking the whole last six miles, right? I think utilizing Galloway's strategy, you're only walking, you know, 20, 25 minutes because you can pace the whole 26 miles. And so, again, I think the analogy plays, like that's the whole idea. How are you taking just a little bit of time off the table for yourself? Then, as you mentioned, it gets deeper because the folks that aren't having fun are generally the ones that – um aren't making social connections because fun is the glue that keeps us tied to our friends, right? They're the ones that are wondering, you know, what happened to the relationship with their kids, you know? Um, and so it can lead to a lot of regret when you're always giving it away to someone else. And especially for the non-entrepreneurs listening, you know, again, if you're just lining the pockets of somebody else, ask yourself, you know, have you kind of over prescribed to this idea of meritocracy? Do you really need that next promotion? And again, I'm not prescribing, uh, you know, a mediocrity. Uh, you know, what I'm suggesting is that you probably will do better anyways. And this idea that you always have to be, you know, tethered to some sort of work device um, might be ill fated. Start playing with the variables. Start seeing what happens if you don't answer emails from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Like that's a simple exercise. You mentioned like what are some easy entry ways into this. Yeah. Like, see if anything really happens if you're not accessible for four hours out of your 24. And, you know, eight times out of 10, unless you're someone that, you know, works in the service industry where you have to be, you, you need to answer clients if, you know, your equipment goes down or, you know, like the, the group that I work with the most, physicians who do need to be on call, you know, yes, that's not going to work. But for most of us, you know, for knowledge workers, no one's going to care if you answer that in the morning instead of, you know, right when it comes in. Right. So um, you've, you've got, you know, great quotes and, and you know, cultural <laughs> references that I get so many of. So I'm like, oh, you know, anyone who quotes Terry Pratchett in a book is like, oh, we're already on the same <laughs> way. Like, I wonder That's if, one of my favorite. Yeah. I was wondering if you knew um, Greg Brown in his book, who, his uh, song, Who Would Have Thunk It? I, uh, someone just recommended that to me. It's a book, right? A children's it's a, book? It's a song. I, it might be a book. Okay. Too, I don't think it's a children. It, it's a, he's a folk singer. Um, I think the song okay. came out of the, then like, I'm not familiar. I'm early sorry. 90s. I think I'm mixing. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. It's, but it's, it's basically, you know, the, the audio version of, of what you're saying. Um, I'll, I'll give you the last, um, the last stanza. It says, so we used to say it's, it's so the whole thing is like we used to say this, like we used to say I could walk all night down the gravel road to the tiny town and the door all open. It says, now I say I could walk all night, but it's not true. I want a bed and a blanket breakfast. And so the course is like, <laughs> who would have thunk it? Like like all this stuff, like who would have thunk that that Rage Against the Machine would not be my thing? Right. So, <laughs> so the, the last verse is. um um, we used to say, I don't care if I never grow old, I'm going to flame, going to burn, take one quick turn and be gone like James Dean. Now we don't say that it's too late to die young. So we sit at the table long after this, after supper and a good wine. And we sing, Hey, Hey, who would have thunk it? 
<laughs> I love it. <laughs> Just this like, oh, I, I get, you know what? I get to let go of my old identity, even if it was true then, right? Like um, there's no shame in being present in the moment and saying, boy, this is what draws me now. I, you know, weird. I want to read a book. I want to sit and meditate. I want to smell flowers. Like I don't have to be the the ego personality complex that I've been defending with my life. You know, and this wisdom again comes from someone, you know, I'm sure uh, similar to yourself, you know, you have ideas that you trust and believe in because you, you have them refined, but then you bounce them off of somebody else and they provide context that um, is just really helpful. Right. And so I was talking to, you know, cause for me, I, I, I think mindfulness is certainly a component of my work, but I don't, I, you know, I'm on my road to mastery. I, I, I certainly, you know, wouldn't coach anybody in mindfulness. And so a practitioner um, who I trust, uh, you know, was kind of accepting my ideas and, you know, was, was really gracious, but then had indicated that the people that she works with, especially around where, you know, we're at that have been successful in their own right, you know, certainly happy with where they are in life. Um, she kind of used this metaphor of a wind up doll, right? Like we spend our first, you know, 40 or 50 years winding ourselves up because, you know, we want to, sh we want to get there. We want to arrive. Right. But what happens, especially if you have been just going, 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 and I certainly fall in this camp is that, once, you know, it's kind of like a kid that's ready to let it go. And, and if you're wound up too tight, it just goes, right. And so that's where so many of us find ourselves. So for anyone that is kind of, you know, at our energy level, like that can be, that can be that weird, you know, I, I you know, midlife crisis is overused, but like, I've got to figure out everything now. Right. Cause like now I have the space and I have the money and like, I have this freedom that everyone's talked about. Right. And like, so I, I, you know, now I got to sort out every, every single problem. And I, you know, being able to what you talked about, being a little bit comfortable of a slower pace, you discovering that, you know, being inviting in awe and curiosity and wonder um, and allowing that, that connection to sort of find you again, the same way it did as you were a child can be a magical thing. So I guess that's just that gift was given to me. I'm trying to regurgitate it. And hmm. um, because I certainly think, you know, we having fun is restorative and that that's what my vibe is. But I also think folks that are sort of, you know, at the bottom of what science calls the U shaped curve of happiness are trying to figure it all out. Right. Because um, it, there is this level of discomfort when you've kind of got everything you need, you know, and you're like, OK, this is what. I was told I was supposed to do. And then you're like, I, I want to, you know, by the end of the year now know what the next 30 years is supposed to look like. And, you know, finding that comfort in the calm and, and it kind of enjoying the space and not, you know, forgiving yourself for not figuring it all out at once, I think is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had an experience where, you know, I, <clears throat> I think like a lot of people, I grew up very sensitive to winning people's approval. Right. So so there was, you know, all huge swaths of my life were kind of unexamined in turn, you know, and then so I had a, a, like a midlife crisis in my early 40s where I suddenly came became very clear to me all at once how and, and I, I in my own mind, I put it in terms that were quite unkind, which is, I think, one of the characteristics of some midlife crises is like I've been a total fraud. I haven't sure. I haven't ever, you know, which wasn't true. Uh, like, but there was this way. Imposter which, syndrome, right? As this, they say. Well, this rebellion <laughs> against like everything, everything I thought I knew about myself was like me trying to please someone else, like get the A, win the approval, get the smile. And so there was this, this huge vacuum when I was like, well, what do I like to do? Like, yeah, I don't really know. And the best advice I got was like, okay, that part of yourself is a little baby. Now you've got to raise that <laughs> little baby. Right. And, and to get away from this, you know, the, the sort of culture of, of adolescence in which all we're supposed to be doing is like looking at everybody else and seeing, am I OK as part of this group? And like one of the nice things about the Internet for me is how it allows weirdness and 
like people to say, okay, this is who I am, you know, and like, and I look at like, in, when I think in high school, like, you couldn't be weird, you had to be in one of four different blocks, or else you were like unprotected. Right. And, and a total yeah, there's some truth in that for sure. And just yeah, you know, like, I mean, ha think... having the patience to allow yourself to, to try things and fail and experiment and get to know that part of myself that I had never nurtured. Yeah, I um, do you know Dr. Gruner Cook? Mm, no, uh, she's done a lot of work in transcendence, but um, the uh, and I might have mispronounced her name a little bit, um, so I apologize, Dr. Cook. But the uh, um, when we had our discussion about this, uh, you know, this idea that in adolescence, especially if you're kind of you're living in a level of psychological safety. I meant fun is a great tool to explore those identities as you talked about, right? Cause it's not fair to, you know, I think even the most staunch sort of believer in spirituality, like your identity isn't set, right? It's meant to be played with, right? Like, you know, do I like this music? Do I like these types of people? Do I like, you know, I like this particular activity, but I hate the, the, the particular tribe around that. Right. Or, right. I, you know, I don't fit in there. I'll give you a perfect example. I love bicycling, but for whatever reason, um, you know, dressing up in tights and, you know, that kind of group, I've never, I've never enjoyed that experience, I think, because I'm always afraid of crashing into them. You know? like, <laughs> and so playing around with like, where do I fit in can be a great way to use fun as a tool of self-discovery, right? Where it becomes problematic. And again, I get these are just semantic constructs, though, is when you're really worried about rank. And as you know, I talk about that in the book too. I mean, that's essentially where happiness in the West has gotten off the rails, right? Like now that we've quantified it on a scale of one to 10 and actually have, you know, these, you know, global happiness indexes and wonder why Norway is happier than us, right? Like mm -hmm. it's because not, we're all, you know, how do I win? How do I outrank that next person, right? When fit, is abundant, right? Like if you fit in with a group of folks, you know, even if it's kind of freaky, as you mentioned, you know, that, that never has to end. That's just you enjoying your time. You enjoying that like connection with, you know, that puts a smile on your face and you're not worried whether or not, you know, the highs and lows, you're just grateful that you're able to enjoy the things you're doing, enjoying the places that you are and enjoying the activities, you know, that, that fill you up, that bring you joy and delight. And so, you know, at the end of the day, that's, you know, I just find that that, you know, th there's some sustainability there rather than just chasing some outcome that will come and go. And then where does that leave you once it, once you arrive? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, in terms of like ranking myself against others, that, that was something else that I've discovered pretty recently was like an undercurrent of my subconscious personality. It was always like, you know, well, me or him, me or, me or her, or where, where, who's, who's, you know, on, on whatever. Um, and there, I, I read a book earlier this year. I, I uh, podcasted with um, uh, Ronald Siegel. It called The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary. And just the title, like, oh, like I get to, you know, I get to be special because I'm just like everybody else, <laughs> right? as opposed to needing some sort of, um, of, of reflection, right? Because if we're if we're trying if we're trying to achieve rank, then there's always there's, there's, there's always competition, right? I'm thinking I'm thinking about like the uh, the idea of finite and infinite games by James Carse, right? Like yeah, yeah. fun is a is an infinite game. You just want it to keep perpetual. No, that's exactly right. I uh, you know um, had written a chapter about that, and then when Simon you know Simon Sinek kind of brought it to the forefront of uh, you know I engineered it out but i um i think you're spot on i meant you know an I infinite game for folks that don't know what that is it essentially means you can enjoy the process and you're not trying to win or lose you know um and that's exactly right i think if you can add you know almost dip in and out of it right because i talk a lot about game theory in the book and I think you should set up episodic games. All of us should. I mean, they're fun, right? I mean, yeah. they, you, we run races for a reason to kind of compete against ourselves. And um, so, you know, 
not having some things in your life that are integrated towards an outcome will become problematic. Again, this is always like, I don't know if you find the same, but when you know, you're kind of forced into a corner of absolutes and it's like, no, this isn't about either or, right? It's about yes and. Like, of course, there are gonna be times in our life where we want to improve. And so you figure out what that measure is and you have fun with it. And maybe you, you even treat it like a finite game, right? I certainly did with running, right? I tried to best myself each time and that was enjoyable. Um, but that's not sustainable because ultimately you are gonna run as fast as you can and you're gonna have to either decide, was that how you found fun? or is actually just the process of running enjoyable. And so you wanna keep doing it despite the outcome. And those are important questions. Yeah, so one, you know, my, my favorite sport is ultimate Frisbee. And it, there's a, you know, one of the rules, one of the fundamental tenets of the game is called spirit of the game, which is basically, it's not, a, it's not an official game unless people are having fun. Like, like that's more important it. than winning. And so, have- yeah. So I play in these leagues where, you know, like the 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 idea is like, you know, you want to win the game. There's like a scoreboard and there's points and there's someone counting. And at the same time, you see the new player who's never played before and they're open and you you have your doubts whether they can even catch it. But you don't think about it. You throw it to them because that's more important. Like the community, like in five years, they'll be good. They'll bring in more people like to have the vibrant community and to have everybody having fun is like well woven into the DNA of the sport that except at the very, very highest levels, which I don't even pay much attention to anymore, um, you know, is more important than any score. And I would bet dollars to donuts that, that um, the attrition of that uh, is low compared to other forms of physical activity. Because what I've found, you know, I, this is one where I can make a more, uh, you know, data grounded assertion is that, um, and again, it goes back to, well, we won't get into system one, system two thinking, but when you have easy access to something that's enjoyable, it's just easier to make it uh, into a routine because you want to do it again, right? You want to see those friends, you want to have that fun, you know? Um, Again, win or lose, you know, you know that the experience was worthwhile and you're making those connections and um, you're spot on. I was going to, when I was about to interject, uh, I mean, it's not as profound, but uh, that's also why I enjoyed rugby because we would play competitively for two halves, but everyone's favorite part was the third half because with rugby, the two teams, you know, no matter how much we beat each other up, we would all go to the pub you know, and just have a really good time together. And it was really about, you know, uh, going to that, uh, you know, that campus and getting to enjoy it. And you were the, uh, everyone was just such gracious hosts, you know, it was just such a fun sport for that, for similar reasons. Yeah. It's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's so easy to remember that in certain environments and intramurally, and yet when we, you know, when we watch professional sports, which is most of what our, um, you know, spectatorship is about, it's so rare, like that there's like YouTube clips of like moments of sportsmanship in, you know, tennis or in running and, and football. And it's like, you know, you can look at it and cry because it's they're so they're so poignant and yet they're not the norm. Well, I, I... <laughs> So this is probably uh, a little bit deep, but I I always love our conversation, so I'm gonna go there. Um, One of the things that I find fascinating is, uh, have you read the book Sapiens yet? Um, Half of it, yeah. Yeah, so for anyone that's read it, essentially you leave that book realizing that essentially all the constructs that dictate the way we live in the world are man-made, right? Money is essentially made up. It's a creative endeavor that we've all bought into, right? And it certainly seems real to us because if we don't have it, our lives are gonna fall apart, but it was made up, right? So that we could kind of move on from hunter-gatherer, right? 
definitely made up, right? There's actually been a couple of amazing documentaries just of the last couple of years about how weird it is that corporations are considered a person. It's just the creative thing we've made up, right? Dogma for the most part, like even if you are religious, you kind of have to, you know, then at least understand that the other 299 were made up, you know, kind of a Robert (laughs) Gervais argument. And uh, so, you know, essentially all of these things that sort of rule our lives to some degree were man-made and where I'm going with all that is so a sport. And yet like we are so tied in, you know, there's a, there's a component of the human condition really that buys into that meaning something that's, but you know, especially American football, like that's, you talk about that to almost anybody else outside the U S they could care less yet. Um, you know, more people watch the Super Bowl than vote for the president. Like it's this, <laughs> you know, that stuff fascinates me, you know, especially with, you know, with regards to the fun, because clearly people find that enjoyable or they wouldn't watch. Right. And so anyways, I digress, but I think that's, you know, when people really get in the weeds and are asking again to move back into the, you know, the, w- what we've really been trying to dig into, like realize that a lot of these constructs that you've bought into are man-made. And once you understand that, you can start to put them back together in a way that might suit you more, right? Yeah. Still play by the rules, because if you don't, right, you're not part of the tribe and, and, and things will go awry fairly quickly. But if you intimately understand kind of the mechanisms, again, meritocracy being one of them, you know, and then you say, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna set my own goalposts. And once I arrive, then I'm gonna start to play with the constructs that I can and be more mindful of, you know, the things that are important, some magic will start to happen. And I've just seen it time and time again. Mm. Yeah, and it's funny because, you you know, you begin the book, I realize, with the story of uh, Will Novak, which is, you know, basically how one person's fun became a spectator sport, right? So, like, part of what you're saying is, like, let's, let's not all just be spectators of other people having fun. Let's let's democratize it and let's universalize it. Yeah, absolutely. And understand that it's yours to create. You know, again, going back to like, if you think, well, I just forgot how to have fun. Is that true? Or are you just equating fun to what you see on Instagram? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, it doesn't have to be a vacation. It doesn't have to be picking up a hobby. It doesn't have to be anything I say. Like there's it there are ways for you to find pleasurable experiences if you just sit down and think about it. And so creating the space to do that is an important step, figuring out what it is you want to do, even if that is through the lens of duty, right? Like maybe it is that you're taking care of young children and and that seems like a burden. How is there a way to reframe it so that you're co-creating experiences with your kids that you actually want to do instead of feeling like it's an obligation? Mm. Um, you know, so the list goes on, but just understanding that you can reclaim some of your time becomes an important first step. Awesome. So let's, um, leave, let, leave people with the, the title of the book, where, where, where they can find it and where they can find you if they want to keep following your wisdom. I appreciate that, Howie. So the book's out everywhere. Um, you know, wherever you enjoy purchasing your books, obviously you can get some, on Amazon, you're air, but I always... You're in airports too, aren't you? Uh, did you see that on social media? <laughs> somebody, somebody posted a picture of their book on social media in an airport and yours was next to it. So I'm like, Ooh, damn. Yeah, it was, um, uh, I, I think, you know, I don't want to, it's got a beautiful cover. So I'll, I'll you know, <laughs> I don't want to take too much credit. I think I just got lucky that Simon Schuster <laughs> did me right by, you know, um, but I am surprised at how many airports it is, and I'm grateful for that, obviously. Uh, so, yes, it's available wherever you purchase books. If you happen to be flying, I think it's the most major airports. <laughs> and uh, um, I been uh, I write about the science of fun on my website, michaelrucker.com. So if you don't feel like purchasing the book, you can kind of tiptoe into, into some of these ideas on my website there. All right. Well, Mike, thank you so much for for bringing, reminding me of fun, for uh, reminding uh, our listeners and for all you do and for taking the time today. 